morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this, you are very, very welcome. Are you joining me this morning in my spare room? Um, I was thinking this week how I could be creative. Could I do it in the bathroom? Uh, could I do it in the garden? Uh, could I do it in the kitchen? But then I thought, you know what, Mike, just play it safe. Um, hopefully, um, it's not too distracting. Hopefully, you can focus on what I'm saying rather than where I am. Um, so we're going to look together at Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Um, but firstly, while you find that, I'm just going to pray and ask God to help us today. Father God, I thank you that we can gather around your word virtually. Lord, there's one body, Lord, together. Lord, I pray you the Spirit would be aware amongst us. Lord, I pray you would uh, convict us of our sin of the times we've fallen short before you and our rebellion of you. But I pray you'd also illuminate Christ. Lord, I pray you'd show Jesus in this passage. I pray you'd um, widen our hearts um, to, to accept you as, as king. Lord, I pray you'd encourage us and equip us to live this life of freedom. Lord, and I pray you'd put other things in our lives at the back of our minds. Lord, then your spirit would really open our eyes and our ears to your truth this morning. Praise your name. Amen. So I wonder if I asked you um, to speak to a non-Christian friend and ask them to write down a lot of things that they see a Christian life being like. What they see the Christian life being like. What would be on that list? Or if they'd say, oh, being a Christian is a bit like being a slave. Having to obey God, the master, do what he says, not necessarily do what you want. Where they'd see, oh, being a Christian is narrow-minded, that there's only one way to go. Being a Christian is boring. You have to sort of not do the good stuff that you want to do and do all the bad stuff that you that you feel like out of duty you have to do. Maybe you think being a Christian just means being really judgmental and looking down on other people and, and grading yourself and others. Maybe you think it's just about being good and nice and positive in the midst of terrible situations. Whatever they think the Christian life is like, um, we know that it clashes with the world. Right now, the world's message, obviously, COVID-19, stay safe. But before that, the world's message was for you to be authentic. Be the true you. Be the person deep down that you want to be. Explore who that is and don't let anyone else tell you anything otherwise. So I add that any heart. At its very core, that's quite anti-authority, isn't it? Basically saying, no one can tell me what to do, who to be. And if they do, they deny me my freedom. I should be able to be whoever I want to be. And that clashes with Christianity, doesn't it? Christians who say, no, I sit under God's authority. I, I follow what the Bible says. I maybe subdue any wrong feelings and wrong motivations that I have. And instead, follow Christ and put him first. Compared with the world, that seems really strange and, and seems like slavery and, and seems like bondage and, and captivity and not freedom. But Paul's really keen in this letter to the Galatians to point out that the true gospel is a gospel of freedom, not a gospel of chains and slavery. So this morning, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see two things in Galatians chapter 3. Verse 23, we're going to see two things. The first thing, that the true gospel changes our status. And secondly, the true gospel changes our future. Now, I'll read the passage in a minute, but I just want to do a quick recap of Galatians because I'm aware that some of you might be watching this for the first time and not sure where we're at. Some of you uh, maybe weren't with us before Easter when we sort of unpacked the first bit of Galatians and had a bit of an Easter break. We focused on the cross and Easter story. And now we've come back. Uh, last week, we started with the middle of chapter three and and now we're following on that um, in the next few weeks. So basically, Galatians is a book written by a guy called Paul to a church, a church that he planted uh, a few years previous. And he planted there with the message that of, of grace and grace alone through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection alone, that following Jesus and, and accepting his sacrifice was all that you needed to be accepted into God's family. But over time, as the church grew and, and things changed, the church have moved away from that truth to a mix of a Gentile and Jewish sort of mentality. That yes, Jesus was there and true, but also you had to carry on doing the stuff that Jewish people did, following the Jewish law, putting that first, maybe getting circumcised, and following rituals and sacrifices. So Paul has written a letter to them to remind them of the things that he taught them and to point out the error of their ways and steer them back in the right direction. And he's banging on this drum that is central to all this, that Jesus is 
death and resurrection is central to the Christian faith. And anything other than that is not a true gospel. It's damaging and it's no gospel at all. Because the truth of the gospel is that Jesus has paid it all for us. So anything on top of that is, is wrong. And last week, Pete showed us that Paul in Galatians chapter 3 was talking about the law and how the Jewish people and the, this Galatian church have moved the law from a, a, a means of showing us our sin and showing our need for a saviour to how we become justified before Christ or God. Which is meant to be what Christ was there to do, to fulfil the law. So firstly, let's let's crack on. Let's look at um, chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. So we're going to see that the true gospel changes our status. Let's read uh, verse 23 and 24 together. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Paul starts out specifically talking to the Jewish people. He uses the word we because he himself was of Jewish heritage. He was actually, before his conversion, before he was met on the road to Damascus by God, he was the, one of the chief Jewish people. His job was to enforce the Jewish law. And therefore, he persecuted Christians, he, he killed Christians because they were not following the Jewish law. So when he says we, he's saying us as Jews, before Jesus came, before faith, we're under the law. We were, the law was our guardian. We were in custody of the law. The law was sort of the protector in a way, watching over them, protecting them, keeping them safe from God's wrath. I suppose that is the, the job of the law, isn't it? You look at our laws in our country. Their job is to protect and to stop wrongdoing, to, to make wrongdoing really obvious. Now, if no one was doing wrong, no one was evil or no one had the wrong thought or deed, we wouldn't need the law. So the law is there to expose wrongdoing. That's what people pointed out to us last week, that Jesus, it shows us Jesus, shows our need for Jesus, shows God's people that they can't keep this law themselves. They're not perfect. They can't keep God's standards. And therefore, a saviour is needed. A mediator is needed. A, a king is, is promised to come who will fulfil the law. So that's what we saw last week. And this week, Paul picks up on that and tells us in verse 25 that now the faith has come. We're no longer under that guardian. The master is here. You don't need a guardian if your parents are there. You don't need a guardian if the master's there. You don't need looking after if the, the person who is in charge is there. The guardian is there in the short term, isn't it? It's there when the, the parent is not available. So now that the master is here, there is no need for the, the law. There's no need for the custody of the law. The law is still there. The law is still good. And that's important when we view the Old Testament. But we don't see the Old Testament as irrelevant now that Jesus has come. Now, the whole job of the Old Testament, the whole job of the law is to point towards this, this coming saviour. So where that's something you struggle with, maybe you struggle reading the Old Testament, struggling to apply it, maybe because of God's wrath, God's law, God's power, his judgment. We don't need to see that as, as contradictory or irrelevant. The Old Testament points to this coming saviour, this promised king, who's going to come and fulfil the law, fulfil the Old Testament promises out of the land of Abraham, which we see throughout the Old Testament, as God keeps it. And keeps his promises. So that's still relevant and important. But here Paul is saying. The law has been fulfilled. The faith has come. Fully fulfilled by Jesus. So verse 26. So now. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God. Through faith. Gone from being captivity. Slavery. Children. Sort of a message there of sort of being under guardian. To now being God's children, and then later on we'll see is. Now Paul's on to everyone, not just the Jewish people, he's on to the Gentiles as well. We see that in verse 28, which we'll come to in a minute. But all of them, the Jews and the Gentiles, are now one in Christ through what? Verse 27 For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. They are all one because they've clothed themselves with the same Christ. They've put Christ on. Nothing else is needed. The law fulfilling Saviour has come and completed the promise. 
Now in verse 27, Paul does mention baptism. Before in the Old Testament, circumcision was the way of being accepted into God's family. It was a sign of you belonging to the Jewish line. And that was still continuing. And Paul in other bits says, no, no, you don't need to circumcise anymore. Here he's saying, no, no, baptism is now the form of you recognising yourself as a Christian. And baptism is a symbol, isn't it? It's, it's an act, an act of worship as we sh outwardly show an inward change. As we've put on Christ inwardly, this the sign of putting to death our old life and, and coming out as new resurrected people in Christ. So Paul isn't saying, right, you have to be baptised. Although the Bible would say that the step of being Christian is to then get baptised and externally show the inward thing that's happened. But Paul's showing the, the, the baptism process. That we have put on Christ. A change in status has happened. We've clothed ourselves with Christ and therefore we are one because we put on the same thing as each other. Verse 28 points out that there's nothing else that matters. No performance is needed. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor is there male or female for you're all one in Christ Jesus. It's no longer about performance. They're no longer under the captivity of the law. The law has been fulfilled by Jesus. The perfect holy son who came out the line of, of Abraham, Abraham's seed. So now if verse 29 is, is true, then you are belong to Christ and you are part of Abraham's seed, part of God's family. And therefore your heirs, we've gone from, from captivity to being looked after to being heirs as part of God's family. So when God looks at us, he sees his son's righteousness. He sees Jesus. He doesn't see Mike. Because I've clothed myself with Christ. I've put to bed, baptised away my, my old self and, and become Christ. He doesn't see my sin and brokenness. He sees his perfect son. Before the throne of God above, we have a strong, a perfect plea. Our chains have gone. We've been set free. My God, my saviour has ransomed me that change of status is massive and has massive implications for our future and our lives so secondly we're going to see that change in the future of how that change of status affects our relationship between us and god and now paul goes on in chapter four to flesh that out of how this inheritance being an heir being a son being a child of god works now i've been all week trying to think of an illustration that would help us at this point thinking how can how can I flesh out what Paul is saying here? But Paul does that for us, really. And I feel like we're better spending our time understanding what Paul is saying here in verse 1 to 7 than me trying to come up with another analogy or illustration to help us. So let's read verse 1 and to 3 together. Paul says, What am I saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees under the set time by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery, under the elemental spiritual force of the world. When the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. To redeem adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls our Abba Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are a child, God has also made you an heir. Paul's right, this has spoke about two groups, hasn't he? He's talking about the Jewish and the Gentile people. The Jewish people were under the guardian of the law. They were God's people, protected by the law. And the Gentiles were outside of God's family. They were, see that in verse 3? They were slaves under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now Paul spends verse 1 and 3 telling us that that's the same, really. So the, the Gentiles were slaves under the ways of the world. So the things that ruled them. And the Jewish people were under the guardian of the law. The, the law ruled them. But now they've both got this change of state. They've both become children of God. Because the time has fully come. Now we tend to think of slavery. At a, maybe a more modern mindset. Maybe we see it as 24-7. Working hard. Being punished. Being whipped. Really nasty masters. Ruling over the slaves and making them do menial tasks and dirty work. 
And that probably did happen in Bible times as well. But the Bible also shows us that slavery was also could be anyone. If so, if you owed someone money and you couldn't pay that, you became their slave. So anyone could become a slave, any nationality, any generation, any sort of qualification or skills background. You have a really skillful person, a slave to someone and doing not necessarily the dirty tasks, just the everyday tasks. That's what we need to have in our heads when we look at this passage. As verse three tells us that they were just slaves. They were under the spiritual force of the world. Because of the debt they couldn't pay. So before Christ, both Jews and Gentiles were slaves. They were under authority. They were they couldn't do anything about it. There was a debt that could never be paid. They had to wait for the full time to come. And then verse four, that time has come. But verse four, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. When the set time came, Jesus came, born of the Abraham's line, born of Mary, born a Jew, to redeem everyone under the law. Who now can be adopted into God's family as sons. Now, slaves would have been released when their um, debt was paid. Either they complete the pet or the master will let them go. Either way, they'd be released. But instead here, the slave has become the child. And the heir, not just a child to protect them and give them housing, but a child who's an heir who will take over the father's inheritance, will have the father's inheritance. And that time, it says there, has fully come. Jesus' death and resurrection has fully happened. The promise is secure. The inheritance is secure. And yes, it's a now, not yet thing as we wait for the full blessing to come. But our status has changed. And therefore, our future has changed. I wonder how you're coping with lockdown. Um, I'm sure you're just dying for normal life to resume, whatever normal life looks like. Just for normal things, just to be going back to work, maybe to be able to knit to the shops, and um, maybe just to be able to hang out with friends, and um, to do what you really you want, not to be chained down, not to be locked down, for the barriers to be lifted, for the anxiety to go away, for peace to rule rather than fear over our lives again. I've seen lots of people post on social media about how the life is going to be different once the lockdown is finished. Maybe they've said, I'm going to go and explore the world or I'm going to be nice to people. I'm going to cherish every moment I have with people. I'm going to make to celebrate the little successes in life rather than the big things. I'm going to make sure I see key workers as really relevant and praise them all the time. To be honest, I just can't wait to go back to McDonald's, to go through the drive through again, get me Big Mac, large chips, large Coke, and so maybe some chicken nuggets on the side. Obviously, I mean, go to McDonald's drive through on the way back from church because I can't wait to meet again with you guys. But imagine lockdown finishes, normal life resumes, the barriers are lifted, the chains are gone, and I decide to stay in. I act like that hasn't happened. The status has changed. We're no longer under the threat. The pandemic is over. But yet, I stay in. I stay away from people. I keep myself limited. I chain myself at home. I mean, that's not me saying that staying at home is wrong. It's me saying my status, the status has changed and I haven't let that status affect my life at all. Because you might think, Mike, don't worry. Um, I don't really cling to my gospel change. I'm not really religious. I don't really stick to the Jewish law. I don't get circumcised. This passage isn't really relevant for me. But you see, we chain ourselves. We act like slaves. We don't accept the true gospel as the gospel of freedom, because it affects our relationship with God. I know myself, how I feel before God and how I pray to God, how I feel when I sin, all point to this performance-based religious way. That I bring some sort of performance, some things to the table in some way towards God, positively or negatively. And that is completely against what this passage is telling us, that we have clothed ourselves with Christ. That is all we're bringing to the table. Nothing else will satisfy and nothing else is needed. Maybe when we sin, we stay away from God for a while until we feel a bit more holy. Maybe if we're feeling a bit down and feel like we've fallen short, we maybe put others down and make ourselves feel a bit more righteous. 
maybe instead of like lovingly living life and sacrificing for each other, we do it out of duty. That make that person make me feel, make, will think I'm good. Um, that person will notice that I'm, you know, maybe getting food for that person. I'm doing all these good things out of duty rather than out of love and out of worship. And then we feel like we deserve God's love. And then we go to God thinking, oh, our relationship is fine. See, the way we chain ourselves manifests itself in everyone's lives differently. So examine your heart and, and you'll know what that is for you. But it's slavery. It's the opposite of what this passage is saying. Clothe yourself with Christ. Be free. You are an heir. You are a child of God. Live that out. Let's look at verse 6 and 7 together. I think I found that really helpful this week. Verse 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who called her Abba Father. So you no longer are a slave, but God's child. And since you are a child, God has also made you an heir. Now, Pete showed us on Thursday night um, that Abba Father and um, God's spirit um, is really helpful for us to get our heads around. I'm going to spend a little bit of time now thinking that through because Abba Father is an intimate term. It's a term that mean, means personal, intimate relationship with a father. And it's a spirit that cries out that God has sent his spirit as after he sent his son, he sent his spirit amongst us to help us to, to have that relationship with God and to live that out. And it's a spirit that longs to be in relationship with God the Father. It makes us perfect regardless of our performance. A spirit that says, there is no place I'd rather be. You see, when we think of this sort of slave becoming uh, a son, we know that's a massive difference, isn't it? Because the slave, although he lives in the household, can't run into the master's bedroom because he can't sleep at night and tell him about his nightmares and his fears. But the son can have access. Now the child just wants to please the father because he loves the father. The slave just wants to please the father because that's his job. The slave turns up every day out of duty. The son wants to be with the father. It's an intimate relationship. Abba father, our hearts cry out to be longing to be with God. So if we long to be with God, the spirit is working amongst us, then it's not slavery. Our hearts long to be with God the Father. And it's a relationship that nothing can separate from. A love that is the same yesterday, today and forever. We've clothed ourselves with Christ. We are perfect. We have this inheritance that will never fade and never spoil. But we make ourselves slaves. We chain ourselves to the law. We chain ourselves to religion. We chain ourselves to the world. And we don't live the gospel freedom out. So instead, we need to put us our name in verse 7. So you know you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Three questions I want you to think through as we close. Firstly, have you accepted this change of status? Have you clothed yourself with Christ? Secondly, what ways can you see that you're living your life as a slave and not as a child of God? Not as an heir, not as a son. And thirdly, as a son, as an heir, as a child of God, how will you live out your freedom? Will you live a life of worship? Or will you live a life of duty? Leave a moment for you to think about the question, then I'm going to pray. And while I'm praying, I'm going to read out 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. They keep coming to my mind as a read Galatians, a truth that would be good for us to know. So I'm going to, a few moments of quiet, and then I'll read that and pray together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never spoil, perish or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Father God, I thank you that we have been saved. Thank you that you've taken us from slavery and captivity to being your son, adopted into your family. So now we are one with you. We have clothed ourselves with Christ. And now when you see us, you don't see our sin and brokenness, you see your son. Lord, help that to change how we view ourselves. Pray that how we view you. We pray that that changes how we live our lives this week. 
Lord, help us to grapple with them hard truths, Lord. Help us to examine ourselves. Pray you convict us of them areas in our life where we chain ourselves. But Lord, please enlarge our heart. Help us to see the grace that you've given us and the joy in that. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth in your name. Amen.